how you doing out there? Who said that? Oh, that's you. Just fine. How many of you got a nap this afternoon? Pam, you didn't get one? I'm sorry. You had too much music on your mind. But that was wonderful this morning, though, that singing. And I hope that you'll continue to do well and praise God. Thank you for being here tonight, and I hope you'll see all the announcements you see printed for you. Our senior adults are going to leave this uh, Friday afternoon at 2.44, and we're going to get to Bellingraph Gardens right around quarter to five or somewhere right in there. We're going to eat. You know, that's one of the things we like to do. We're going to eat, and then we're going to go through the gardens. And if you have signed up and haven't paid, I need your money soon so I can make an accurate accounting for how many will be going. Also keep in mind the rummage sale that we're going to be this coming Saturday at 7 a.m. to noon. And please keep that in mind. Also, as we're talking about Christmas music and music, please keep in mind the Christmas music that we will be having on that Sunday, December the 15th at 6 p.m. Uh, go ahead and invite your friends and your relatives and anybody else you come in contact with. Just give them an invitation. That would be an entree for them to come into the church. And when they come to church that night and hear the beautiful music, they're going to want to come back, I know. Thank you for being here tonight. Let's stand and greet one another, if you will, please. tonight, come thou long expected Jesus.
be seated for just a minute while we have an announcement about our Lottie Moon Post Office. I just wanted to tell you, when, when I was young, I loved to play post office. <laughs> do tell. We still kind of like to do that. But anyway, this is a different subject. This is Lottie Moon Post Office. The, uh, some of our newer college kids may not understand what this is. We have a, uh, a set of boxes that are set, set up alphabetically. If you're going to give Christmas cards uh, this year, uh, the, uh, to our church members, if you will just uh, take your Christmas cards and place them in the appropriate box, if it would be me for Braswell, you would put it in the B box. And then I'm responsible for going there and seeing if I have any Christmas cards. Whatever postage you would pay for the 44 cent stamp, just put it in a little box there. And instead of giving it to the post office, we'll give it to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Each year we're able to raise uh, several hundred. I think last year we raised about $600 uh, by giving our postage to Lottie Moon instead of the, uh, the post office. So it's set up right outside, uh, and it'll be there until uh, just the day, uh, the Sunday before Christmas. So don't forget our Lottie Moon post office. Thanks. For some of you who might not know, Lottie Moon was a missionary to China many years ago, and we collect an offering each year in her name and in her honor. Every penny of that offering goes overseas. None of it stays in the states for administrative costs or anything like that. Every penny of it goes overseas to be spent in support of missions. $7,000 is our church goal for Lottie Moon this year. So send lots of Christmas cards to church members. Let's stand again and sing. There's a song in the air. There's a star in the sky. There's a song in the air. There's a star in the sky. There's a mother's deep prayer. Christmas song. Let's sing the first verse again. Since you just heard it and you just learned it, we'll sing the first verse again, then we'll sing the last verse, okay? There's a song in the air. There's a star in the sky. There's a mother's deep prayer and a baby's low cry. And the star rains its fire while the beauty
Pray with me. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you so much uh, again for just who you are, for this opportunity, Lord, that we can come together and, and, uh, and, and fellowship together, sing praises together, uh, worship together, and learn more about you together as a church body. I thank you so much for the fellowship we can share. I thank you so much for uh, this, this time of year, this season, um, and what it seems to do to people. Uh, God, I thank you for the joy that, that you place in our hearts. Um, that, that the assurance of our salvation uh, gives us cur uh, courage and, and confidence and comfort every single day. Um, I thank you so much for that. Lord, tonight I pray that uh, as we take up this offering that uh, each and every dime, Father, is used to further your kingdom and bring glory to your name. Uh, because that's our goal, Father. Uh, that's what we desire to do is to bring glory and honor to you. Uh, Father, I praise you and I thank you. It's in your glorious and precious and holy and righteous name, Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. How's everybody? Great. We are in Acts chapter 20 tonight, skipping a lot of territory in the book of Acts. There's a lot of history and a lot of narrative there. It's beautiful stuff. But um, I felt pulled towards what I'm going to share with you this evening. And... Um, Preachers should never apologize, and I'm not apologizing for a moment for what I am going to say. Dr. Berger, I'm going to apologize for everything I cannot say uh, this evening. It's just too rich. It's deep. It's good stuff. But I want us to read some scripture together and uh, find verse 17 of Acts 20, and we'll go from there, if you would. And we'll read scripture. Stand to your feet when you find it. <coughs> the Word of God says this. From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears, and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, 
testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus Christ to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Father, so much truth, so little time to share the great truth that's there as we partake of this word that's in front of us, of this spiritual meal. Fill us up and teach us and use us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Now someone asked one time, how do you measure a man, in particular, a man of God? How do you determine his success or his failure? Um, the passage we read, this one, in a, to the Ephesians, is, is a passage that speaks to us about the measure of a man of God. Paul has called the leadership to the port city some 30 miles away from Ephesus. Now you can tell, by the way, what they considered and how they measured him when you come to the end of the chapter and he speaks in verse 36, when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing that they would not see him anymore. You can tell that by what they said. I've not experienced that too many times through the years where people have uh, wept at my departure. Some of them may have wept for joy, I think, but not too many times. Sometimes I've seen it. One place where we were when we were getting ready to leave, the worship leader chose, I kid you not, oh happy day that fixed my choice. But in other places there were men who really and truly openly wept when we left. Paul was about to leave and he had some parting words that the new leaders needed to hear. Now I want you to hear me, I'm not about to leave. Um, I don't think I'm going anywhere. No man knows what tomorrow holds, amen. But I don't have plans to that effect. Um, you're stuck with me for a long time. But I do think the church needs to be reminded and those who hear, who are present, who have a call on their lives by Almighty God need to be reminded God's standard for measurement of the man of God and they need to see it and they need to understand it. So I'm going to give you some truth from this passage 
and try to lay some things out for you that I hope will help you. And the first word, the first thing that I want to say is the pastor must be focused. The pastor must be focused. You see, there are three words used in Ephesians 20, 17 and following that describe the threefold threefold role of the pastor. The first word is the word elder that you saw in verse 17. For my leaders he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. That is the word presbyteros. And it speaks of the pastor's role as leader. Now, there is this move today where you have pastors and elders. I want you to know something. They're synonymous in Scripture. Pastor is elder. Elder is pastor. And they're used interchangeably. This describes the leadership role of the pastor. You see, the pastor guides the flock of God. He's not a dictator. He's a leader. Adrian Rogers said, I guarantee you if I were a dictator, everybody here would be a tither. Amen? I'll amen that. Not a bad statement. The fact of the matter is, and I'm speaking to all of us, but especially to our young men and others who have the call of God on their lives, Dr. B, that'd be you and me. <laughs> We're the others. All right, I'm, I'm speaking to you and I'm telling you that we're given the role of standing before the church and pointing the way that we believe God wants us to go. Now I need you to, I'm going to pull over and park for a second. Because you see, in order for you to point them the way, in order for us to be able to say this is the way to go, we need to have gone there as far as we can. You need to go out in front. A good shepherd goes out and explores the land before he guides the sheep into it. And so you need to go there at least in your prayer life and in your preparation. That has to happen. The second word that's used in this passage of Scripture is found in verse 28, and read it there with me. Therefore take heed to yourselves, to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. There's your second word. Preachers, God has declared us to be overseers. This is the Greek word episkopos. We get the word bishop from there. You can even hear the word Episcopal Church if you listen to that word. This speaks not just of the role of guiding the church, now it speaks of the role of guarding the church. The word Episcopos means literally to be a curator, Pam, to be a guardian of something. And we, ladies and gentlemen, we, the preachers, we, the called pastors of God, have the responsibility to be guardians of the church. Now, I know too many of us that think that means we're supervisors of the church, and there is some level of that that takes place in our lives. But above all, we are guardians, and I'm going to get to that before the message closes I just want you to see it. The third word that's describing the pastor is the word shepherd. And you say, I don't see that in there. I want you to look at verse uh, 28 again. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. The word there, and some of you have King James, it says feed the church of God. Right there. 
The word there is the verb form for poimene, which any of you who have studied in your pastoral ministries class is the word from which, by, through which we come with the word pastor or shepherd. Interestingly, in Spanish, they're the same thing. Jehová es mi pastor. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my pastor. We say the same thing. One of my friends, Dr. Dwight Smith over in Wayne County, was having me translate. And he wanted to tell a man, he said, you are the shepherd of the church. And so I looked at him, I said, tu eres el pastor de la iglesia. And he said, you are the pastor of the church. Tu eres el pastor de la iglesia. And he looked at me, I said, same word. <laughs> Should have come up with something different. It's our role as provider. In other words, men, we are called by God to groom. Now, I don't mean get your comb out and comb their hair. You groom the flock of God. When a shepherd goes to work, and he's doing his work right, when he grooms the sheep, he gets down there and he starts parting the hair and looking for all these parasites that get into their skin. And he starts pulling out ticks. And he starts putting in, rubbing in oil and other ointments to kill the parasites they get in there. He looks at their nose. Boy, so many churches get their noses out of joint. And that's the first place the preacher needs to look. And he needs to get the oil of the Word of God and of the Holy Spirit. He needs to rub their nose real good with the Word of God. I want to tell you something. I suspect a sheep doesn't like that very much. And I know for a fact... A lot of churches don't like that at all. But the pastor is called by God to do these things. It's our necessary responsibility. Now listen to me carefully because some of you plan to go to the mission field. You need to know this so that you can train pastors on the mission field. When I received my doctorate, they said, you have to, choose, a, you have to tru, choose an emphasis, either pastoral ministry or missions. You're a missionary, you have to choose missions. I said, no, sir. I need you to give me permission to have a combination degree of pastoral plus missions. And they said, this doesn't make sense. I said, I train pastors. I need to study both of these, not just one of them. I have the one and only degree granted by the Board of Trustees of Mid-America Baptist Theological Seminary that, it, that has a focus of both pastoral and missions at the same time in terms of ministry. But it's necessary, guys. You are going to be involved in teaching these preachers. Now to fulfill these three roles, the role of going before, the role of guarding, and the role of grooming the flock, to fulfill these three roles, the Bible says in verse 28, take heed unto yourselves. You need to focus on yourself first. By the way, that's a mariner's term. That's a term a pilot of a ship would use, and it means to guide a ship into safe harbor. You need to guide yourself into safe harbor before you try to guide the flock of God into safe harbor. Let me say it another way. The pastor has to feed his own heart before he can feed the flock of God. Preachers, we need time in the Word of God. Church, guard the preacher's time in the Word of God. 
Can I say thank you for doing that for me? Can I say thank you that you make sure that my time is guarded in the Word of God? I truly appreciate that. I'm afraid I know far too many men that have so many responsibilities upon them that they have little time to spend in the Word of God except perhaps early in the morning or late at night or on Saturday when everybody else has relaxed they're digging and getting ready for Sunday. Isn't that true, Dr. B? Don't you see that all the time? This is a sad thing. And I'm telling you, we need to guard the preacher's time in the Word of God. Now, all Christ followers need time in the Word, but preachers need to dedicate themselves to the Word of God. I was so excited when I started my studies at William Carey and then planned to go on to seminary, and I thought, I'm going to spend time in the Word of God. Boy, was I mistaken. My goodness, the places they had me studying and the books and that and 100 pages in this book and I'd carry four books home and each one of them 100 pages of reading and it's all about the Word of God but it was not the Word of God. And I thought, this is killing me. I've got to do something about this. So I set myself a limit of how much studying I would do for my classes each day and I dedicated and committed myself to try to spend time in the Word of God and make the real Word of God, not books about the Word of God, to be my priority. Now I want to tell you something. In all of my time at uh, William Carey and then later at um, New Orleans Seminary, in all of those classes that we're talking about, five years of classes, in all of that time, I only made 10 B's in all of those years. I'm telling you, God blessed me and gave me an ability to retain the information and to make it through there. And I believe with all my heart, it's the principle of Matthew 6.33. I'm not bragging on myself. I'm bragging on God, okay? Matthew 6.33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Preachers, spend time in the word of God. You have to do that. You have to feed your own flock first. You also need to, your own heart first, excuse me. You also need to fill your heart with prayer and worship. Not just the Word of God, but prayer and worship. The best way to feed on the Word of God is to fill your heart with prayer and worship first. If preachers don't worship, preachers forget their work. And if preachers don't pray, preachers can't preach with power. We've got to learn to feed, to take heed to our own selves first. Then you need to focus on the church from there. And what do you do? Well, you do this. You feed the church. The Word of God says, take heed to yourselves and to the church of God and to the flock, God's little flock. And... Uh, Shepherd them. Feed them, if you will. The truth of the matter is this, men. Sometimes you have to forage for food. There are times when your life is going to feel dry and dusty. There are times when the ministries in which you find yourselves working will be spiritually cold. When we arrived in southern Peru in, in, in 19... Uh, 89, when we arrived there after our studies in Spanish in 1988 and arrived there on the field, we arrived in one of the coldest, spiritually speaking, cities that I think I've ever stepped into in my life until we went to Trujillo for one of our meetings. And I thought, okay, that would keep us not so bad after all. And we, but I'm telling you, it was difficult. The churches were reserved. The Christians were non-expressive. They were not openly accepting. They miss 
trusted. They watched you with suspicion. It was a hard place to minister, an easy place to walk away from. I promise you it was. God kept us there nearly 10 years, and we loved every minute of it. But what you have to do is you have to go out and you got to start digging and find that food when you're in those kinds of situations. If you are in a church that's like that, thank you people that we're not there at 38th Avenue. There have been a few cold times, but few and far between. I'll blame those on my own self before I'll blame them on you. But I want to tell you something. The flock still has to be fed. So you still have to dig. When you're on the mission field and you're planting a church, Chris, when you're there, you still have to feed on the Word of God and you still have to dig. And I want to tell you why. Nick, Cassie, guys, listen to me. What happens is you're teaching on an ABC level, very elementary. You're teaching the simplest of truths. And you'll concentrate so much on those simple truths that you have committed to memory that you'll forget to dig in the Word of God. And when you do that for two or three or four years, you will dry up. So you got to keep foraging for the food. Keep digging around. There are those times also that a pastor needs to train the flock to eat the right food. Shepherd the flock of God. Take them to the right pastures to eat the right food. When one of my friends went to his present pastorate, he found out that his people didn't know how to listen to a sermon. They weren't used to listening to sermons. They didn't know the Word of God when he got there. They could not quote, not even the names of the books of the Bible. We won't get into verses of Scripture. Not even the names. And so he had to train them to eat the right food. You know, children have to be trained to eat the right food. I've got one daughter that still doesn't know how to eat turnips. But I'll forgive her because I won't eat that cursed weed called okra. But you have to be trained to eat the right food. Some of y'all weren't trained well. You still eat that nasty stuff. Love the Word of God as much as you love your okra. <laughs> and then the third thing that you need to do, preachers, is you have to fight off the enemies of the church. Adrian Rogers said you can tell the size of a man by what it takes to stop him. And if you haven't discovered it yet, people, the church has its enemies. And the preacher of God is placed between the church and those enemies. I have a problem. I understand the concept when people tell us that, Doc, that we should lead from behind. I understand that concept. But I have a serious problem with it. Because every picture I have of the, of the pastor in Scripture, he's standing between the enemy and the flock. And most of the time, that enemy's going to go where the pastor ain't. And it's not an easy place to be. We need to lead. We need to be out in front. Now... There's some things that have to happen in order for that to take place. 
the pastor has to fall in love with the church in order to fight off the enemies of the church. And Paul spoke of the church and he talked about his love and he talked about this, this great church that God purchased with his own blood. He loved the church. And Paul loved the church because God loved the church and because Christ loved the church. And preachers need to love the church as well. There's a woman here that I love and I've been with now for more than 33 years. And when I look at this woman... Her name is Pam, if you didn't know it. And when I look at her and I tell her I love her, I do not say, Pam, I love you with most of my heart. Tell her I love her with all of my heart. And if someone came to me and said, I've come here to hurt your wife, but don't you worry, because I don't intend to hurt you. If they were to say something like that, you think I'd step aside and let them do it? You think I would easily give in to something like that? I'd fight for my wife. Test me if you don't believe me. Ask this young lady here how good a shot I am. Devastated those rotten pumpkins yesterday when we went out for our family tradition of killing pumpkins after Thanksgiving. We need to love the church, folks. We need to love the church because God loves the church. Because God gave his own blood for the church. You say, huh? What are you talking about God giving his own blood? It, exactly what he did. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is the Lord God. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He gave his blood. Now I'm going to tell you something about uh, a little biology lesson here. When, you, when you're born, when a mother carries a baby. And she's carrying that baby. That blood is not... Her blood that's circulating through that baby, that blood is that baby's blood. That blood comes when you go and type that baby. What, where, where does that baby come out? Type of the father. Is that not right? When the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary and Mary conceived, this is the blood of God flowing through the veins of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's kind of deep if you stop and meditate on it. And God shed the blood of Jesus for the church. Now there is one who will stand in the pulpit for love of money. But he'll leave when the enemy dries up the funds. There is another who will stand. But as soon as someone opposes his leadership, he's out the door. I heard that so many times through the years. They don't want to follow my leadership. I'm out of here. I'm telling you to be tenacious and stand in the gap. And stand there until God releases you to something else. I know too many, Doc, and you receive it over there at your office. They call you on the phone and say, I want to give you my resume and put my name in front of this church or that church or the other church, please. Because I don't want to be here anymore. Folks, I want to tell you something. Men, be tenacious and stand in the gap. Do I need to say it a third time? I think I will anyway. Be tenacious and stand in the gap. 
You need to fight off the grievous wolves from without. Verse 29, the scriptures tell us this in our, in our text. I know this, after my departure, grievous or savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. The church is always going to have its enemies. There are those who want to destroy the church because the church belongs to Jesus. But there are those that want to destroy the church because they want to have preeminence. Diotrephes wanted preeminence. And he brought great harm on the church with that. I, uh, I know some that come in pretending to be one thing when they actually have something else in mind. I've known of false groups and I think one of them came into our church just a few weeks ago and sat right back over there. Right back over there. And they'll come into the church. And they'll sit there. And they'll look around and they'll find somebody who seems to be a loner. And they'll look that person up and they'll try to befriend that person. And try to get through the door of that person's home. They'll look for elderly. They'll look for young people. They'll look for people by themselves, as I said, and they'll go after them and say, hey, how about we come by your house and discuss a few things with you? And they'll bring false doctrine into your house, and they're trying to steal you away into their false group. That happens. And there were four who were with us some weeks ago that I watched and I looked at, and I watched their reaction to the message. And I watched them two by two get up and leave out before the message was ever over. And I had a suspicion of their presence and why they were there. I'm telling you, if your pastor's suspicious, don't think, well, you just, you know, you're cynical. I had too many years under my belt, folk. I know the enemy's going to come after us. I know he hates this church. I know he does. And he wants to destroy us, guys. You've got to be alert to this, fellas. You've got to be alert to this. You need to preach against false doctrine. And if necessary, you need to confront. It's not fun, it's not pleasant. But sometimes it's necessary to literally walk up to someone and say, cease and desist and don't come back. And sometimes it needs to be done. I found some in the home of a church member where I was ministering once and I walked through the door. Didn't ask to be invited in. I saw them in there and just opened the door and came in and said, what are you doing here? And the owner of the house said, why well, they're trying to teach us this book here. They say it's a companion to the Bible. And I looked at him and I said, they are false teachers. And I turned to the group. They said, we worship Jesus. I said, you do not worship my Lord Jesus. You worship a false Jesus. And you get out of this place and don't come back. Most scared looking people I've ever seen in my life. Because I kind of had to duck to stand inside that house. I couldn't even stand up straight. Sometimes you have to be confrontational. Oh, by the way, I don't like to be confrontational. It saps every bit of the emotion and energy out of me. And when I'm confrontational, what you don't see, and not even this lady sees, is when I go off and I weep. Because I've had to confront it's the most difficult thing you have to do. But it must, it must be done. You have to fight off, guys, not just the grievous wolves from outside. Sometimes you have to fight off the godless workers from inside. Verse 30, he said this. Look at the passage. Let's read 29 again. 
I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up. Let me read that again. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. You reckon, I don't know, I'm speculating, and I won't know till I get to heaven. But do you suppose that Paul knew that someone in the group that he was speaking to on that day was a false teacher? You think he had a clue? Because, I mean, he's speaking to an audience, and he's got, I don't know how many church elders there, how many pastors are there, Nick, but he's speaking to them, and he said, someone from among yourselves is going to rise up and do this. Going to get full of himself, and going to try to pull disciples away to follow himself, instead of following God. There are, there are those from within that will lead a church astray. Some of those find their way right into the pulpit and they stand in the pulpit and they'll lead the church astray. You can turn on any number of church channels on cable network and you can hear them teaching and preaching on those uh, networks. There are those who find their way to teach and lead Bible study groups. There are wannabe preachers and shade tree theologians but trying to lead folks astray. One furlough. Um, I met a man in one of the churches where we furloughed who promised me that if I would correspond with him, this was back before email, but if I would correspond with him, he would teach me which part of the Bible I could, well, the Bible I could trust. And he was a teacher in his church. I thought, Pastor, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes. Men and women are like that are a danger to the church. And the pastor's got to stand up for his church. We've had them. We had them in Tennessee. And I sat there with my nominating committee and I listened to them and they talked about this person and that person and the other person. I said, that person doesn't need to be teaching. And you're going to go to him and you're going to tell him he's lost his class. He cannot teach in his church anymore. They didn't like me very much, Brother Bob. He liked me a whole lot less. But he left the church and peace reigned in its place. Sometimes the greatest revival happens when a false teacher leaves. So men, you have to fight. Let me wrap this up, tell you how to fight the good fight. Verse 31. The Word of God says, Therefore watch... And remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Men, you have to fight with tears. When you sow the seed with tears, you'll doubtless come again rejoicing. You'll have a harvest. You have to fight with tears. You have to fight with time. You can't fight the enemy if you don't give your time to God and let him govern your time. you got to be sold out to this thing. And you have to fight with teaching. You have to be devoted to teaching the Word of God. You must do it. And if at the end of your ministry, people who know you can say you kept your focus and you fed the flock and you fought for the church then I want to tell you something. You're going to be a tall man in anyone's book. You're going to stand tall. That's the kind of man 21st, church, 21st century church needs. That's the kind of man we're praying God will raise up 
from this fellowship and send all over the world. Fearless men who will follow God no matter the cost.